All right, welcome to week two of Child Development 150. This week we're going to talk about diversity and inclusion, and then in another short video I'll talk about the assignment for this week, which is talking a little bit about crafting and formulating mission statements that are really, really essential to running any kind of program. So I just want to start off with some statistics. I'm going to do this through a couple of the weeks of this class. I'll talk about um, the need for infant and toddler care, the need for school age care, how many children require that, how many families are working, just to kind of reinforce and put on a national scale why we kind of do this. So the United States is becoming more diverse. Um, we're seeing this reflected in our census data that we take um, every 10 years. So racially, culturally, linguistically, we are becoming more uh, diverse. Um, and in some cases, that's gonna require some more adaptations and accommodations um, for the diversity that we're seeing and also for children with special needs. Um, up until recently, I worked part-time for the County of San Diego's Regional Center as a vendor for them. So I provided in-home um, kind of therapy, support, um, training, um, and help for children, infants and toddlers um, with special, ed special education needs or special needs in general. So for example, if you had a child who had Down syndrome, then um, I would come into your home and I would support the parents. I would do a little bit of um, holistic therapy with the child. So identifying where they are cognitively, uh, language-wise, self-help-wise, social-wise, every kind of domain that you can think of, um, and then setting up and helping the parents um, provide educational experiences in the home for those young children until they turn three years old. So special education and early childhood education and being accommodating for children with special needs is a huge passion um, and wheelhouse of mine. So I'm going to talk about that throughout the class, but I do want to bring up how important it is that we um, welcome and provide diverse um, environments for children with special needs. But as we are becoming more diverse and as we are accommodating children with special needs, we might need to change ourselves. Um, because we are also finding that programs that um, identify diversity, honor diversity, and work within it um, are helping to close the achievement gap for children. Many of you have already taken the um, Teaching in a Diverse Society or Teaching in a Diverse Communities class. It's one of the core classes of the child development departments um, within the community college system here in California State. It's one of my favorite classes. Um, I really, really enjoy teaching it. Um, not only do I get to talk about special education, but I get to talk about um, bilingualism, which was something that I studied in my master's program. Um, and so we know that we have really diverse programs and we probably learned about the anti-bias education as well. And through that, you probably learned that there are achievement gaps when it comes to what children are learning, um, it, depending on communities that they come from and things like that. So by, um, by supporting programs with the anti-bias education, then we're also closing that achieve achievement gap for children. And I do take this class fairly locally um, here in San Diego County. We are really, really lucky um, in that we are a border region. Um, and so we have a lot of really specific cultural and linguistic needs. We have a lot of different cultures here. We have um, an influx of people from all over the world because we are on a transnational border. And I think that's one of the things that makes us so unique and our programs are probably going to reflect that. So, once again, I talked about um, my love for children with special needs and their families um, and then making them part of our early childhood education programs. So in this case, um, I'm always going to link with the video. I'm not going to play it while I'm talking. If you'd like to, you can go back to the video afterwards or you can write down what it is. These are all things that are really, really um, accessible on YouTube. Nothing I ever post for you guys will be out of the realm of normal. It's not something that you can only find in my office or anything like that. They'll always be available on YouTube because I want you guys to show this to your staff um, or um, take a look at the things that I have posted and think about putting, bringing that into your staff meetings or your staff trainings or something like this. The Early Childhood Educator Competencies video series is all on YouTube and it's all from the state of California. It's fantastic. I think there's, there's a bunch of videos um, covering a wide range of topics. I use them very regularly in my state run preschools uh, where we needed to kind of know this type of information. We've already maybe have done trainings on it, but they do have a great video on special needs and inclusion. Um, I think it's only, I think it's less than 20 minutes, but it's a really fantastic video. So please check it out if you're interested in learning more 
or if you would like your um, staff members to learn more about their stuff. So when we look at children uh, with, and families um, with special education, um, I do and I will bring up in this class various areas of law that you might need to know about. Disclaimer, not a law student, never was, I'm not a lawyer, don't have a degree. I do know a little bit about the laws that we should be following as early childhood education professionals, either directors, program directors, um, say supervisors, anything like this, and this is one of them. And it's real, just really that um, within a public school, um, we're required to make available to all eligible children a free appropriate public education. Um, and really the biggest thing for us is that it's a least restrictive environment. Um, and really what this is, is that, and we call it IDEA out in the community, um, it's really just that children ha should have education provided for them. So for my infants and toddlers, I went into the home and I worked with families because that was the least restrictive environment for an infant or a toddler. 18 months old, six months old, almost three years old, something like that in your home, in your home environment, that's your least restrictive environment and that's where you're doing the majority of your learning. So someone like me is helping you do that in that environment. As you, after you turn three, it typically happens within the school district. We also have another one, which is the Americans with Disabilities Act, and this really prohibits discrimination on the base of disability in employment, in government, and public accommodations, commercial facilities, transportation, and telecommunications. What does that mean, though? So um, I'll give you an example of my own. There was a local kind of brew pub in Oceanside where I live that we really liked to go to for a while and had to close down because they didn't have appropriate public accommodations for um, adults with um, special with special needs, most specifically who were in wheelchairs or braces or um, needed some kind of physical support. So they needed to close down, they needed to put a ramp in, um, and they needed to widen the doorways into their bathrooms so that was that it could be accommodated for um, adults um, who are in wheelchairs or needing physical accommodations. So that's an example you wouldn't think a brew pub or a bar would need to do that, but they did. Same with us. So if we have employers or were public accommodations or something like that we need to be aware of these um, laws and limited laws and statutes in order to be uh, a great program um, I put in um, some a link for you guys um, a child without limits org um, and it's got some information about federal laws really the biggest thing with idea and the ADA is it's just the law to make sure that we are supporting the people in our community who might need just a little bit of accommodation when it comes to um, uh, providing educational experiences or having employees. Um, so I'd like you guys to learn a little bit more about this. So I've put some links in that you can look at on your own time. So what would this look like in an early childhood education program? So I've talked a little bit about the laws now. I really want to um, kind of hit it home with what we would experience as early childhood educational professionals. So a child with an identified special need, and it could be anything, it could be a speech delay, it could be Down syndrome, it could be cerebral palsy, um, it could be a club foot, hip dysplasia, there's a whole range of um, special needs that a child could have. They'll either have an IFSP, an Individualized Family Service Plan, if they're under the age of three, and an IEP if they're older than that. Both of these plans will identify and provide the services that a child is eligible to receive. For example, a four-year-old might receive 30 minutes of speech therapy in a group at a public school site and also attend a part-day preschool at another location. An infant with Down syndrome might receive in-home, early interventional, physical therapy, and occupational, while also attending 30 hours of care at an early childhood education program. And then a three-year-old with global developmental delays, so in most areas of their development, they're showing some delays, will be transitioned from the FCC care so in-home care with therapies provided at home with the parents into a part-day preschool at a school district where the therapies are part of daily services and the family child care provides before and after care. So this is kind of what I, what I want to uh, hit home for you guys is that the IEP, the IFSP, the things that we have provided in the IDEA Act can also be part of the work that we do with children. We support a lot of working families. Most of us are supporting working families in the work that we do. So how can the school provide um, the educational um, therapies that they need to? Well, we also kind of bridge the gap for those working families. 
So that this is just an example of how it happens. I've sat on many IEP and IFSP meetings where the school district goes back and forth with the parent advocating for their child saying, okay, well I work, so I'm gonna need a bus um, to get from my Discovery Isle location um, back to the school district and back because I can't be off at nine o'clock in the morning um, on a Wednesday morning, something like that. Um, so that's typically the work that the parent is doing is advocating what kind of therapy the child is gonna receive through um, the county or through the um, public school system. And then you, as a provider, are really there um, to make sure that you are accommodating to the children. You have aisles that are wide enough um, for a child with a wheelchair. Um, you're allowing aides to come in if a child has autism, that type of thing. So the child can really thrive in your situation when they're not receiving this type of care. Um, so when we talk about those accommodations and adaptations that I just talked about for children with special needs, this is kind of the idea that I was thinking about. So universal design for learning, um, and I have a PDF online for you guys um, to look at as well. It's from a textbook um, that I did years ago where I was learning about children for education. But really, as I consider us as early childhood professionals, part of a multidisciplinary team. So parents, physical therapists, speech therapists, service coordinators or social workers, either from the county or the state, um, early interventionists, which is something that I did um, going into the home to help the parents. Um, so all of those people working with the program director, the site supervisor, the director, the assistant director, whoever is their management team, and then the teachers who are providing that care every single day for that child. So they need to be aware of um, what that special need is, and then they need to be able to meet the accommodation in the classroom setting. Um, but really, when, when I form this curriculum, I'm trying to hit all different learners, and this is the same type of thing. If the curriculum is designed to meet all the type of learners that we know about from Howard Gardner, um, then accommodations are gonna be set into place from the very beginning. It's not gonna be really hard to um, take somebody who has some physical limitations into the classroom if you're already meeting the needs for this wide variety of people who are learning by seeing, by doing, by feeling, by touching, that type of thing. If we've built that into our curriculum already, um, accommodating children with special needs or very diverse learners or um, English as second language learners is going to be so much easier um, and easier for the teachers to do. And you as a professional or the management team supporting those teachers is going to be easier as well. So I'm going to jump to just diversity as a whole now. Um, so in child care centers and homes, we have to be prepared, prepared to serve an ever-changing and increasingly diverse group. The expansive growth of this demographic highlights the need for settings that consider the language and culture of the children being served. Children of refugees and immigrants now account for 25% of the 23 million children under the age of six, compared to just 14% in 1990. States like California, Texas, New York, Florida, and Illinois account for half the number of children and immigrant families. Research has shown that these young children, especially our dual language learners, benefit from quality child care. So that is from US Child Care Aware, which is where I get a bunch of my statistics because they're specifically looking at young children um, and then early childhood education as well. So in California, 25% of all students in K through 12 are English language learners. So those are children who are learning um, English as they are um, after learning or having a home language. So we know that we are seeing a lot of immigrants. We're seeing a lot of children who are um, speaking more than one, maybe sometimes even more than two languages, and then refugees as well. Um, I am recording this in 2018, um, so refugee status has changed recently with our political climate. We still do have a really thriving refugee community here in um, San Diego County. We have lots of Somali, Syrian, Afghani, and Iraqi immigrants, um, some of them very, very long term, and some of them have come more recently, in addition to um, Mexico and our Central American countries as well. So we're really, really, and I would consider us blessed to have such a wonderfully culturally diverse population that we get to serve here in California. 
So once again, I have another little video for you guys. This one is called Supporting Cultural and Linguistic Diversity in Early Childhood. Um, and once again, it's a YouTube video, so you can look up this video, and I think it will give you a really good background on ways that you can support an English a second language learner, um, primarily in a preschool classroom, but they do touch on infants um, and school age as well. Once again, it might be a good um, video in order to uh, show your staff so English as Second Language Learners, this is part of what I did my um, dissertation for my master's thesis on um, was how young children, specifically three and four year olds, learn English and um, how are they aware of what languages are being spoken now. Here in San Diego, we are lucky that we have um, and we're blessed with so many people who speak more than um, one language. I wish that I was one, but I am not. I am totally monolingual. Um, but we do have the luxury sometimes of having a big group of people who speak primarily Spanish and we can employ large bilingual staff. Um, accommodations for less common languages and programs with limited bilingual staff um, should be made within the program. So like I said before, we have a lot of kind of um, Iraqi, Afghani, Syrian, and Somali um, immigrants here in California, specifically in San Diego County. And that might be a language that we're not you know, proficient in, um, especially Central American communities. A lot of people might have grown up speaking a dialect or an indigenous language and they have not grown up speaking Spanish, um, but people might assume based on kind of how they look that they are Spanish speakers and they might not be. So these are some of the ways that I have had children like this and families like this in my classrooms and in my programs and I've supported them even if I don't have people on staff who speak their language. So first of all, don't assume the parent's English proficiency or even language by their nation of origin. Um, so even if somebody um, has immigrated from Mexico, don't assume that they are um, Spanish speakers. They might be speaking, once again, a dialect or an indigenous language that you're not familiar with. We also can't assume that everybody is functionally literate, and I'm not speaking about immigrants in this case, I'm speaking about anybody. Um, I've had lots of different people from lots of different backgrounds um, who have struggled with literacy themselves, and so we don't want to assume that everybody is um, technically literate in our programs. I've worked with lots of families that are not, um, you know, helping them by reading the clock for them. I write down the time they assign their name um, when we have, um, parent conferences, um, I budget three times the length that I'll actually need because I walk through and I read every single part of the parent-teacher conference or the parent orientation with them, um, and I specifically um, like read every single sentence uh, so that I understand and we've walked through it and I ask a lot of questions um, to make sure that I know that they're leaving um, with a high degree and either knowing what developmental level their child is or that they really understand the policies and procedures. The state and the county and, the fed and some federal program programs can provide a translator on a temporary or one-time basis. A lot of times this is through the county. Um, you'll have to ask the, the state of California um, if they can provide a translator. Um, it's typically on a very temporary basis, um, but if you have somebody who is really not um, proficient in English, um, then having them come in, especially in new enrollments, making sure that those policies and procedures have been explained to them in their home language is really important. This happened to one of my colleagues at the regional center, so working with children with special education needs, going into a home with a very kind of rare language that none of us really knew. Um, she uh, took, made another appointment for three weeks down the line, and in that time, she was able to go to the county of San Diego's regional center and say, hey, I really, really need, oh, you know what, I'm sorry, it was um, the county of San Diego's educational board. Uh, and so the Department of Education, she was through that able to come out with a translator who was able to start them off on a really good foot with having that translator. And then maybe once or twice a year, that person would come back with her just to kind of make sure, check in with the family and make sure that everything was checked off. I also make sure that I seek out help from the family's communities. A lot of times this can be aunties, uncles, grandmas, people who have been here a little bit longer and maybe know more of that language and can help translate. Sometimes this is older children, um, so middle, middle childhood or adulthood. I do always um, hesitate sometimes. I don't hesitate. I think about that deeply when it is a, a child who is doing it. 
one, first of all, is that child able to translate appropriately? Um, do they know all of the words in both languages? Are they going to take that job seriously um, and not kind of fool around? You, you know, you kind of know that by the personality of the child. And then also, um, how, might, how is this going to disrupt the parent-family kind of relationship? If this child is taking on a large role and responsibility and has give, been given that to me by, some, by a professional, how is that going to change how the parent and the child interact with each other? I don't want to change that relationship just because I need translating. I could probably find it somewhere else if I think that it's going to be a big deal, but the child's not going to take that role series. Um, so just being aware of who they are and what their strengths and vulnerabilities are when you're talking kind of with others. Then we have other types of big diversity. We have diversity of family structure. We, I've worked with a lot of grandparents who are now kinship caregivers, so their children cannot take care of the grandchildren. And so the parents, the grandparents step in as those guardians, caregivers, or eventual full-time parents. We also have LGBTQIA, um, so families, two moms, two dads, um, and then typically we have um, a lot of foster and adoption here as well. Um, and then sometimes we have single moms, single dads, single grandparents, things like that. So we have wide ranges of how our family structures can come to us, and this should be um, reflected um, in the books that we have, the pictures that we have, um, and how we welcome and accommodate our families. We also have a lot of religious diversity, and so state-funded programs are not really taking advantage of, are not using Christmas, um, Easter, things like that, and those are not being reflected in our classrooms as we are typically running secular programs. But obviously, if you are coming to me from a church program, Christmas or Easter or Ramadan um, or any of those types of things, are Hanukkah are going to be very large and a very big part of your community and your school because that is the community that you are serving and that's wonderful as well. Then we typically have cultural and ethnic, ethnic, ethnic identities that we're talking about. Um, so one of the goals of our diversity work in early childhood settings is to eliminate tensions between the family and the program through sensitivity and responsiveness. So once again, this really goes back to the diversity class that we have here in our child development department, really looking at anti-bias education. How can we identify the kind of programs that we're running and then make sure that we're reflecting the communities and the cultures that we serve in a really responsive, sensitive, and respectful way. Um, so that's that's really what I kind of think about diversity. Does your program support diversity? Does it not support diversity? Do you want it to be more diverse? Do you think you're doing a great job? Um, part of the assignment that we're gonna be doing this week is kind of reflecting on what kind of program you run, what kind of program would you like to run? So once again, the universal design for learning kind of has three qualities applied for all learners. So that includes our diverse populations. A quality program will provide multiple means of representation, expression, and engagement. So they have seven principles. It's equitable, so there's equity. Everybody kind of has a fair chance of achieving something. It's flexible, it's simple to use. There's clear communication. Mistakes are tolerated and even encouraged. There's low physical effort and it's easy to use regardless of mobility or physical ability. So that's kind of the UDL. Once again, there is a PDF up on Canvas in this week's module that gives you a little bit more background about it. But if we start off be meeting the needs of all of our diverse learners, and then we start off with the idea of representing the children that we have and families in our program, ex have, allowing them to express themselves and engaging them with them in culturally responsive ways, then we've done most of the work up front. And having children that are diverse or speak different languages or, or, or have special needs, bringing them into the classroom will be less work because we've started off with that principle. So in conclusion, um, a leader is going to model a process of inclusion and then respect for diversity. And that's really, really going to translate into the quality of care that our teachers provide. So if I, as the professional, as the head, as the leader of our program, really want this to be an inclusionary space where children of special needs are brought into the life of the program with people who are learning English are supported and allowed um, and encouraged to learn with us um, and we engage really respectfully with our families then I'm then if that's what I'm showing as a leader then my staff and teachers are going to pick up on that as well and I'm also going to make a, an effort to hire in that direction as well. 
And we need to embrace these diverse populations because that's how we strengthen our community. And we're also meeting the needs of our community. As we know, the world is getting more diverse, more languages are being spoken. People are coming from all over the place. We need to support the community that we have in San Diego community, in the San Diego community by embracing our diverse populations. Here are some references. But this is the first video. The second video will be a little bit shorter and I'm gonna go into the uh, weekly assignment that you guys will be watching.